Well, I have a confession first. I'm not a soil scientist. Any soil scientist in here? Now, well, trust me, it doesn't stop a lot of people from raising their hand. But it's <laughs> even more than my field. Uh, I think there's people that make a lot of claims in soil science. But I've worked with some of the best. I worked with Wes Larson and Don Strom and Tom Keck. And I know how to spot a real soil scientist. How do you think that is? I can tell by the way they dig a hole. I can. I'm sorry, kids. I see you dig a hole. I'm going to say, let me show you how to do this, OK? Here's the kind of thing I hear from soil scientists. I asked one of, one of my buddies, a soil scientist, if he was going to some conference, and he said, no. I said, well, why not, you know? And he says, they'd have to teach me how to dig a hole faster. That's a real soil scientist. I was out with another one day, and I started to open up the hole, and he says, whoa, whoa, what are you doing there? I said, I'm starting the hole. He says, that's my lightweight traveling shovel, man. You don't just go banging that around like a Montana sharpshooter. <laughs> this is how you know you're out with a real soil scientist. So I'd like to think that I picked up a little something from that. Now, Robert, do we have any background in soils here in the class? Um, we talk about soils in restoration one and two, but this is a class which is a seminar. So some students didn't okay. take well, I'm gonna, any we'll of see those what classes. We'll see what you guys can do. You can question them. <laughs> they will be happy. So when you see this, what, what grabs you about this soil? <laughs> Matt says it's thin. It's a thin soil. Uh, pretty productive soil, right? And mountain big sage brush, I see blue bunch wheatgrass up there. And pretty thin soil, pretty rocky, but not, maybe the soil isn't so rocky, but right underneath the soil. As soon as you see this yellow color, I gotta tell you, you should be thinking. This may be acid. Okay. Here's another one. That's the same thing. The only thing I different I see here is a penstemon over there. So I guess you guys would have no idea what productivity. That's going to be something like 1,000 pounds an acre. Thin little soil. Pretty rocky soil. If it was a really rocky soil, we'd call it skeletal. 35% rock fragments. Okay? But there's something else. You see the difference in color? See that darker yep. color? Do you know what that causes, that darker color? Organic. Iron? Organic. No, high oh, absolutely, you're right. Yes, I'm deaf, so shout it out to me. Yeah, it's the, it's the gray or, or dark color that actually comes from the carbon. So it's not things that you recognize as leaves or something like that, but it's actually, and so this maybe is gonna be, if you know the classification all, that could be a model saw. That depends on how much organic matter you have in the A horizon there. And I don't see much more it's going to be down to a C very quickly, maybe a shallow B, but we're not seeing accumulation as the upper soil leaches down. It's called an eluviation with an E, eluviation below. We're not seeing that kind of movement. So it's not, a, even though that's an old profile, it's not a really well developed. Why we have a third one, I have no idea. Now, as soon as you see this, what grabs you about this? Aside from the fact that I didn't dig it. Structure. What is it? Structure. You got lines, so it's compacted. Yeah. What do you see in terms of horizon? The colors are different. The well, there is uh, one color, but let's let that go for a second. You don't see much, do you? Don't look at this part because that's where the bucket hit it. Look right in here. We're not seeing much at all, are we? It's a very deep deposit without development. What does that make you think of? Alluvial? Fluvial deposit, isn't it? It's a fluvial deposit. It turns out this is mine waste. So all we're seeing, if you did this, it'd be like maybe A, I don't even see a buried A, C1, C2, C3, and those are all the floods going down. Those are the sea horizons. So here's where that one came from. So it's right next, it's not a wetland, but it's right next to a wetland. <clears throat> And we're, this project is a fluvial project. Now, my second confession, I'm not a soil microbiologist either. <laughs> so here you get a talk from somebody who's not a soil scientist or biologist. But I didn't know how to read, okay? And there's something you can read. This is a, a good book. You might laugh at this next one a little bit because you're probably not looking for a field guide to the bacteria, but actually a good book with, uh, with some good stuff that I learned and a good glossary in it too. 
and then this one. All right, we'll start with this. Primary productivity drives the soil food web. Soil food web, eh, kind of vague, but pretty useful term. Nutrient cycling drives primary productivity. Each depends on the other. If I was going to say, Robert, you must ask a question of your students every time I talk or take them, he says yes. So you have to test. So I think you have to get your hands around this. Let's say, because at first it maybe looks a little trite. What doesn't it say? It doesn't say the organic matter in the soil drives the soil food web, or it doesn't say that the organic matter in the soil is driving primary productivity. It's talking about a cycle going on here. Now, when you look at that, somebody like Robert would probably say, well, Rich is so stupid. That's, that's alfalfa. That's an introduced plant. That is wrong. That's a wrong thing to do. Right? <laughs> I'm making this up for you, Robert, I, but I'd say that. OK, somebody, I told you 1,000 pounds back there. What do you think the productivity is there? I spent my life measuring it, but for, I need just a guess. And there's a start. He says a ton. I'm going to say two. Two tons. Two tons an acre. Yikes, that's a lot of productivity. There's a lot of stuff going on in the dirt there. Okay, because we just said one drives the other. That is going to develop a soil hundreds of years faster than one that's less productive. This is another, this is also my revegetation. And now, Robert, I'd say maybe a thousand, something like that, or maybe two thousand, a ton, maybe a ton in there. And that's got some alfalfa and it's got more grasses and stuff. Now here's something that's done on the Clark Fork. And this is, this is supposed to do something when the river comes out of the banks, but it didn't come out of the banks. And, <clears throat> and this is modern reclamation. I don't understand it, but you know, there it is. What do you think the productivity is there? 50. 50? It's a little better, but it might be like 300 or something. It's a small number, OK? <laughs> That's a small number. There is no soil food web to speak of. It looks like a great place for nap weed to me. Okay? So this was to create surface roughness to slow down the flow. Well, this is one of my projects the same age. And this is my surface roughness. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. This one has a good soil food web and the other one doesn't. Now, just to show you. So this, if you can make it out, this is tarragon. Or to make the conculus one on each side. And this is in a place without alfalfa. And this same transect, you see the transect here? And this is with alfalfa. So alfalfa doesn't do anything but the rhizobium in the soil with the nitrogen fixation, which is almost a miracle we don't have time to talk about, but almost a miracle that you could take nitrogen in and turn it into a useful form. N2 is very stable and hard to do anything. I don't know why we're cockeyed here. Oh, it might be. So the, this is the one summary. The microbial biomass in the soil is the driving force of most terrestrial ecosystems because it largely controls the rate and turnover mineralization of organic substrate. Without it, the world would be full of litter and life would end because that would be the end of that. There'd be no more nutrients. And that probably means that it was supposed to be a graft. It decided it was going to take my graphs out for this talk. OK, here's another thing. Understanding what microorganisms are taking from their environment and depositing this waste is the key to understanding microbial ecology. All right, where do the nutrients come from? Well, you can see there's two places. Somebody tell me, where's, the, where's calcium going to come from? From minerals. Where's nitrogen going to come from? Atmosphere. In the big picture, it's, it's going to come from decomposition of organic matter, okay, in terms of nutrient cycling. Where is phosphorus going to come from? Rocks. Phosphorus is going to come from the microbes because it's insoluble. Mm -hmm. When I say come from, I mean for plants. It's insoluble, and especially if you get into a, a low redox soil. And let's say, let's say what else? Oh, uh, you're getting a picture. So just for, this is not particular to today, but this is from some soil. It's not this soil. So calcium is 11,000 to 400. Magnesium is 6,000 and 1,300. So together, there's 16, six times more uptake of magnesium. 
This happens to be contaminated soil, but the plants don't need much <coughs> copper, but they need a lot, there's a lot less zinc. So it just shows you how to uptake. That's not a big deal for the talk today. So what is organic matter? I'll let you read that. And there's another way we can approach it. We say it's stuff that has carbon in it, but it's not carbonate. Yes, go ahead. That last table you just showed, that was parts per million nutrients in a soil versus what the plants have inside of them. Where was, where was that from? It's from Stucky Ridge. It's contaminated. But it's another one of my, it's, it's by Anaconda. It's, it's content. The reason the copper is for molds, historic smelters. OK, so you read what it is, and it's just saying, if you have carbon and it's not carbonate, you have organic matter. It's the dominant source for my, microbial nutrition. It didn't say organic matter in the bulk soil. It just said organic matter, right? Oh, there's a lot of fine print there, but <clears throat> it's released by the soil microfauna, so fauna is animals, tiny animals, and it's going to be like protozoans, nematodes. Nematodes are insignificant words. Terrestrial ones are um, microscopic. And the protus kingdom, uh, just to say your general biology, in the three domain system, what's the three domains? Anybody know? Somebody saying that you know it? Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. They would say eubacteria, eukarya, and archaea, which is the ancient. So two of them are kind of bacterial. So I put it down here. The most you see is paramecia, amoebae, seaweeds, and so forth. Not a big deal, OK? Most of this action, I might have one slide. Did I have a slide on prokaryotes? Well, anyway, on the prokaryotes, the, the early ones, that's where the action's going to be. On the next trophic level, feeding on them in our soils, not so big. Now, I want you to read this. It says, the cytoplasmic membrane enables some substances to pass in and out of the cell. And then you're supposed to look up and say, well, of course, you've got a hydrophobic alpha helix here, and over here a glycolipid. Let's not forget the peripheral protein. Of course I can understand that. If you told me it was a lot like a lattice of popsicle sticks, I could understand it. So there's another area I don't. Not too much on this. But I can tell you there's something very important. Let's assume this is the inside of the cell. We got a bunch of prokaryotes in here, OK? And we got organic matter out here. So these guys in here, their enzymes have to go out through the cell wall, OK? That's why they call them exoenzymes. And act on the substrate out in the bulk soil and decompose that till it gets down to something simple, like a sugar, that comes back through the cell well and meets their metabolic needs. OK? So it's not like this. It's not like the old Pac-Man. <laughs> Enzymes are going out, dissolving stuff, coming back in. To me, the waste products are going the other way, going out. So it's just good to know that this is how it's really, it's really going on at this very complicated level. Now, nutrients can be mineralized or immobilized. In the big scheme of things, I'm nothing but a bunch of immobilized nutrients and carbon. OK? So that means a plant's not going to start growing on me. It's not going to get anything out of me. And that's the meaning. If it's chemically, organically bound nutrients, they're bound or immobilized. And then when they're converted, they're mineralized. So it's going to be like nitrate. OK? It's going to be things that are in a form that the plants can take them up. They're going to be associated with oxygen now. And the words they use, which you kind of have to know, label OM is undergoing continuous degradation. And usually down to something very simple. Whereas recalcitrant OM is going to be very res resistant, and it's going to sit in the soil for a long time without much going on. That's part of the big picture of what we're seeing today. So we have labile and recalcitrant organic matter. Now, I've, I thought we'd have at least a couple people that told me you're a soil scientist. This is the forms of organic carbon in the soil. Who wants to guess at this? What's half of it? Oh, just guess. Not going to hurt anything. It's oxidized. Huh? It's oxidized. Well, what's the, com what's the composition of it? If this, there's a way to do this with the mouse, but I can't do it on this. OK, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's, it's what they call aromatic stuff. Now, I'm an organic chemist, but that to me means there's going to be 
uh, benzene groups and propanes, and it's going to be a bunch of stuff that isn't very attractive to eat, okay? And the next one here, and those are going to be N associated. I'm going to show you this in a minute, but <laughs> it's, going to, it's probably not what you thought it was going to be. Aromatic stuff, N associated stuff. Here we get the carbohydrate. They're not going to be simple sugars, I'll tell you that. And fatty acids and alkaline carbon. That's what's in the soil. Now let's look at what the plants put into the soil. Okay, now who wants to guess this? This one's, this one's going to be easier to guess. What do plants put in? What are plants made out of? First and foremost, cellulose, right? Okay, hemocellulose. It's not a little bit weird cellulose. It's actually a different thing. It's easier to decompose. Lignin, lignin's going to tend to go towards the aromatic stuff. And then some proteins and a bunch of other little things here. Amino acid sugars, well, that's going to be a lot like the N-associated stuff in the first graph. So protein, proteins are going to have uh, N-associated with them, waxes and pigments and stuff. The point is, so we got the stuff coming in, and it's the kind of stuff that can be decomposed pretty good. And we got the stuff that sits there, that's the recalcitrant stuff, and it has a different composition. So here it is, two-thirds of the fresh plant and residues generally decompose in one year. That's something to know. That's the active part of things going on. That's the label out portion. Okay? Only two to five percent of the carbon present in the humus, some would say that was synonymous with organic matter, is mineralized. So we got one, two thirds turning over, one couple percent is turning over. Now, just a couple more things you have to know. Nothing much happens in dry soil. This is the gal that wrote the book, the field guide. Microbial ecology is aquatic ecology. Nothing much happens in frozen soil. You can guess that, right? Otherwise, your refrigerator wouldn't keep food fresh. Nothing much happens deep in the soil. Well, throw six inches of dirt on your face and tell me how things are going. There's no oxygen down there, okay? And, what, and diffusion, right? Nothing much happens on the surface in an arid or semi-arid climate, that's us. It's the first to get wet, it's the first to dry. It's the first to freeze, it's the first to thaw. Anything near the surface is going to have a rough time. One or two more little concepts and we'll get it on here, but I need it, thought you needed a little background. So there's active and inactive bacteria. The active bacteria are kind of always churning along, sometimes not very fast. There may be times of scarcity, but they're still churning on, and they may grow slowly and be hard to detect. That might be important if you were trying to do a uh, data analysis on this, right? Dormancy, dormant populations, they're completely out of it. They may not even be in the same growth form, okay? <clears throat> I want to point this out because of any, to understand any of these, almost any of these subjects, soil science, you have to actually know the method and how things go on the lab. One reason is, so when you get a goofy <coughs> result, you can say, wait a minute, did you take a high T shortcut and drive off the carbonate? Or just the kind of stuff that you should know when you, when you see data. And what you should know here is anything that involves, you can't culture without stimulating these dormant populations who can erupt and you get a totally misleading idea of what, what was the proportions in the soil before that. Oh, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, I think you all know the difference. Binary fission, if you rep reproduce by binary fission, death would just be a probability. It wouldn't have to happen. As soon as you become mitosis, your life is going to end and be carried on by a different generation. So over here we got bacteria, cyanobacteria, proteobacteria. And over here in the protista area, we got plants, animals, algae. The fungi are on this side and the protozoa are on this side. When you have fungi in the soil, it tells you it's well aerated, has to be well aerated, probably acidic. The bacteria would be more in our zone, and I didn't mention that in the actinomucates, which is a filamentous bacteria, so it's kind of in, the, in between the fungi and, the, and that. I just put this in for fun. She's a revolutionary. She's involved with the tree of life stuff. <clears throat> Most organisms are gram negative. That's just a joke for you. Let's just say if you're looking through a microscope, you're going to see a whole lot of, of, of uh, rods, and they're not going to take the gram stain. Okay, where to measure soil health? 
I, this is one of the topics I gave a talk on before, the actions in the mucorrhiza sphere. So it's in the root zone, and if it's a mucorrhiza zone, that's where the action's taking place. That's where the plant's putting out root exudates that's feeding the organisms. Now, if you're this place, you could dig a hole anywhere. There's going to be roots. It's going to be packed. I couldn't tell you one spot's any better than the next. And if you did it here, almost. But I do see there are some spots there that don't have anything grown in them. Now, if you were working for the BLM and they're wonderful, well-managed lands, you might have something like this. <laughs> and if you want to sample here, you'd probably have to just go dig that up because there's not going to be much action, much root sense, anything going out here. Revegetation's in between. So when I sample for this, I center on a, a bunch of grass, usually with slender wheatgrass, and dig right around it and take up the roots. That, and then I knock the dirt off. Sometimes I even cut it off. And it'll be, it'll be uh, sieved out later by the lab. This is the project. This is what it looked like before, the worst of it anyway. Actually, that's still how it is today in that part. And this is the cover soil that we use after. So we remove the contaminated stuff, bring in the cover soil. Now, I just grabbed this picture going 100 miles an hour one day. I was there to meet somebody. What did I see when I look at this but a bunch of, bunch of tubular somethings all over the freaking place, which I have no idea. I didn't look at them, but it's a lot like soil structure, except an unknown tubular form. So I, just, I took this one. I wish I didn't have this slide and had something else. And we, none of us would know that it could be like that. So we remove this, bring in the cover saw. And this is some of my revegetation. Robert's been to this spot. We've taken a class to this spot. It doesn't look too bad. So we're finally down to it. How do we measure soil health? Well, this is pretty interesting. I'm not sure where I put that in. Ah, one way is to just say the veg looks wonderful. The soil can't be that unhealthy, can it? Well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. It didn't really quantify anything for soil health, but uh, it, it looks like nutrient cycling is going on. Now, you could look for other organisms and say, well, it's got ants. It can't be too bad. You know, We don't see ants in the contaminated stuff. But if you want to measure it directly, you got a couple basic ones. One is you have a smorgasbord. And what would we put out on the smorgasbord? You know the answer to this. We would put out the stuff that was in those pipe charts. We would put out carbohydrate. We would put out hemicellulose. We would put out lignin. We would put out this aromatic stuff. And we would just say, go at it. And let's see how much of these decompose or how fast, however we're going to set up the rating system. And that would be like the best. It's called bioplates. And I thought about doing it for this, but I didn't. It's, it, the data analysis gets a little hard. It's an excellent method, though. I might do that again if I was going to do it. You could culture it. The problem with that is we saw as soon as you put out something to culture, and what are you going to put out? You know, I don't know, something with sugar in it, a cupcake? As soon as they put out something, so the populations are going to erupt, and it's not going to be anything like what was going on in the soil. Okay? And, but I'm not saying you couldn't do it, but not at my level. You'd have to be a real soil microbiologist. Or you could do a proxy. A proxy. That sounds good. Now you don't have to have a microscope. You don't have to know microbiology. You really don't have to know much at all. All you need is that piece of paper everybody in the lab has that says, step one, do this. Step two, do this. You know? OK? <clears throat> so it's, a, it's terribly attractive. And all the soil labs are doing it now. You used to have to get a specialized lab. There wasn't many. I had one that did that second one, the taxonomy for this. Now we've got something that, that uh, is going to be easy to measure. Now, organic matter, I think most people, <clears throat> if you only knew one thing for soil, you'd say organic matter. The amount of organic matter, that has to be really important, right? It's measured in percent. We either burn it off and measure the loss, or we put in a leak of versions measure either the oxygen consumed or the CO2 that's given off. Very, that's good measurements. I just mentioned this. Don't use this. It's, not, it's oxidation by some kind of chemical reaction. I forget it. But um, these are the two good ways to measure it. I don't know why I threw that in. <laughs> it's right in the middle of this. OK. So here's the results we have for organic matter. 
Well, let's see. We have the upland control, riparian control, and our re reclaimed stuff. Well, let's see. 8 times 6 is 48, so that tells me there's 6 times more organic matter here. And 8 times 8 is 64, so that tells me there's 8 times here. That's a huge, vo a huge absence of organic matter in our cover soil, isn't there? And if that's not bad enough, the bar typically has 0.4%. I don't know why. It should be zero. That always comes out like this. And we added 1.5%. I'm pretty sure that adds to 1.9. We got 0.8. What happened to the rest of it? That was the labile part, right? That was the part that got decomposed. This is what's left is the recalcitrant part. And here I would have a graph, but this decided to take them out. I brought two things, and they both said they that 40% of the variability in active carbon was or in organic matter. Uh, I forget what was what the other graph, what the other part was. Anyway, we're going to the next one. How about if we said readily oxidized? That sounds good. Active carbon. And then we find out, but really, it's potassium permanganate oxidizable. So the proxy says, we're going to do something really simple. And you tell me how much potassium permanganate has to do with mimicking soil microbes. I'm skeptical, right? I'm skeptical that this is a good one. But it's the kind of proxy that they like in the labs. It conveniently approximate the energy. And they say to microbes. And there's the units. Milligrams carbon, that's the same as part per millions per kilogram. And you oxidize it using this solution. So now we have 100 and 160. OK. Wasn't that just six times? Now it's only 1.6 times. So we see that that's not nearly as big a difference. And wasn't this eight times? And now it's 3.7 times. So we're starting to see that organic matter, the total amount of organic matter, isn't necessarily a good predictor of how active the biology in the soil is. How about this? I think everybody knows this one. You've heard it, right? CDN ratio? Come on, tell me. Yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah, yeah everybody knows it, <laughs> right? So when, it, when it's wide, the microorganisms are mobilized, and when it's narrow, the vascular plants get more. OK, so if I added sugar and water to the soil, what would that do? What would that do to nutrient availability? If you understand CDM, what would that do? I added carbon. The microbes are going to go crazy until they run out of nutrients, and the plant's going to get nothing. So I have anti-fertilized the soil. I have defertilized the soil. Plants are going to be starved. If I added water and sawdust, what would happen? It would be the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. slow. Yeah. OK, because we're still adding carbon yeah. what if I added vascular? What if I added uh, mineral nutrients? What if I added fertilizer? Now it's going to go the other way. The microbes are going to have all the nutrients they want until they run out of carbon. And the excess is going to become available for the vascular plants. That's how that works, OK? Otherwise, the microbes always beat the vascular plants. But they can't use anymore because they don't have, they're going to run out of carbon. Yeah. So the CDN ratio, OK. Now, whoa, that looks like that's the best one. It looks like our cover soil has the tightest one, indicating a good resource quality. And it's better than any of the controls. So this is painting quite a different picture than that total amount of organic matter. And I just put that in your, your equilibrium. They're all close enough. They're all equilibrium values. There it is, the generalization, low CN, high resource quality. Another test. Now we're getting to a really good test, I think. It's not just a crummy one. So now we're going to take, and they call it burst because it's the 24 and the T. Oops, wrong thing. The T24 is 24 hours, so we're going to take some soil, we're going to tamp it down, and we're going to wet it and measure the CO2 right now and after 24 hours, and we're going to see how fast it's respiring. Well, what's respiring is the microbes are respiring, right? So it's metabolic activity of the soil microfauna. And I like this. This is a pretty good test. And we don't, we don't keep going over, but you should understand the method if you're trying to interpret the results. It's not a proxy but a direct measurement of, of microbial metabolism. So now we look at this one and say, hmm, it's better than one control. And it's, let's say, half of, an, of the other control. 
All right. Suddenly the soil that looks so deficit in organic matter is turning out pretty good in the soil health department. One more that's another one. It's a good measurement. This time it's days instead of hours. Mineralization, how much mineral N is generated per day. And <clears throat> again, we see very much like two ago. 3.7, pretty close to that. We had a strong temperation. PowerPoint says, no, Rich, we're not going to put your graph in here. Believe it or not, I had R squared of 0.97, which in biology, you know, you see once or twice in a lifetime, something like that. <coughs> and in that graph, which showed, if you extrapolated from it, we won't talk about why you might not do that, but in 25 years, it'll equal the upland reference. And in 40 years, it'll equal the riparian. So even though the ratios are mm, not as good as we'd like to see, it's coming on strong. Oh, I guess I did. I had a slide to show it too. So it's going to equal the reference areas. In soil time, that's very short time, 25, 40 years. So cover soils lag in all but CN. We have some, okay, so we're getting down to conclusions. I conclude that soil function has been restored to a useful degree and is functioning in an important sense of, of sustaining vegetation by cycling carbon and nutrients. But how is it doing that? Fresh exudates, and that's important. Uh, the main source of nutrition in the soil is coming out through the roots. And plant root turnover, lesser thing, provide enough labile C and nutrients to maintain soil health, despite the lack of OM. Well, the amount of OM is what everybody's going to focus on. On the Clark Fork project, they said, you must add enough organic matter to the bulk soil and they ended up doing it for the entire depth of it. We already know you're out of oxygen. It's equal 2.5%. Well, when I was still working on that project, they started asking me something. I said, wouldn't it be nice if we knew if you had any benefit at all before we get down to the little nitty gritty questions about this? This is one of the reasons I got fired, okay? You're not supposed to say stuff like that. We're all supposed to be on the same bandwagon. Okay. <laughs> so even though we're, it's gonna take a while to do this, we just have to understand that you can't focus on one thing. If you had to focus on one thing, total OM would be about the worst. It'd be the most unrelated to actual function. Go over it again, because it's the recalcium stuff. It's the stuff that turns over 2 to 5% a year. It's not what's helping the plant. It's the fresh stuff turning over at 2 thirds per year It's doing that. <clears throat> now, there was one more test, and <clears throat> it measures supposedly aggregation <clears throat> and these little aggregates, whether they are going to fall apart in water. It's super sensitive to procedure. So I went to the NRCS office down in Dillon and they showed me what doing. I, I laughed. I couldn't stop. It was, just, it was the silliest thing you ever saw in your life. It was totally ridiculous. They said it was seat of our pants or something like that. And I just, it's way, way past being seat of your pants. It's nothing. You're not, you're not doing anything. And so here's the results we had here. I did it, I mean, the lab ran it, and it says it's good. Well, if you can't tell the difference in soil structure between a 10-year-old soil and a 1,000-year-old soil, I'm going to say I'm not really convinced that you're measuring anything very useful with that. But this is a soil lab. Now, I told you, every, all the soil labs are doing this stuff because it's easy. You don't have to know my biology. Here's what he said. He said soils with high aggregate stability have less erosion better equipment trafficability, faster water infiltration, less surface crusting, more diverse habitat for soil microorganisms. If I had to choose just one health test, I'd pick soil stability. And I say, if I could only pick one guy to be the PR man for my company, this would be the boy. <laughs> so the main thing, Fresh exudates and plant turnover, root turnover provide enough labile C and nutrients to maintain, maintain soil health despite the lack of a reservoir or pool of OM in the soil. And like we said at the beginning, so we're right back to the beginning, and this, whoops, and this in turn runs nutrient cycling to sustain productivity. So here's the summary of what I said. Here's OM 8 to 1. This is the ratio of the reference soil to the cover cell. This one's still five to one, not min, uh, end mineralization, but that's one we said is proceeding so fast that it's going to equal the reference soil between 25 and 40 years. So that's not so bad. 
Active C, now we're down to three. CO2 respiration, two. C to N ratio, well that's actually misleading because low number is better. So you could actually think it of, I, maybe I should invert that, put one over it and put it down there. And then this one we don't care about so much. Primary productivity drives the soil. Nutrient cycling sustains productivity. It's a tight cycle in which the larger oilworm reservoir plays a rather minor role. So focusing on that total organic matter is flat out misleading. And the CO2 in particular, I thought the, the burst respiration supports that, despite the passive of active C. And then we can go right back and say, yeah, oh, that looks good. I guess probably the soil health is, you know, <coughs> if, you prove, if you proved that stuff with the data and you had bad looking revegetation, you still wouldn't have anything, would you? Now, since we got a couple minutes for this, I really wanted to, I've seen the soil structure questions at a lot of conferences to people who don't have a clue. And it, I mean, they could just as easy ask them, what's the structure of the wax in your area? You know? <clears throat> so I'm going to give you just the shortest course in this. On the one hand, aggregation. You have particles coming together. On the other hand, planes of weakness or voids, something that sets them apart, OK? Aggregates void or whatever other aggregate out there. This is what structure is about. And it's of interest microbiologically because guess what causes a lot of that structure? Well, it's stuff from the prokaryotes. Oh, there I finally mentioned that to And that was, those are the ones with the uh, hyphen mycelia in there so they can have that effect on it too. You have to know what it's not. It's not clods. You know how you look in a a field that was plowed up when it was too wet has a big, it's not clods, that's not structure. This is important. It's not fragments caused by a rupture of soil mass across a plane of weakness. And that could happen when you're digging a hole, especially if you dig it my way and you dig around a plant and then pry it out. You're prying that out so that we have to be careful about that. Or by cementing compounds. Anybody here name one cementing compound? Just name one. I know you can do this. What would be a cementing compound in the soil? Iron. What would be? Iron. At a level, that's a surprising answer. A, a sesquioxide of aluminum or iron at a very, very small size. I have to, that's right, it could be. What would be a most? Calcium. So what do you make cement with? Yeah, so calcium carbonate is going to be a good guess. The other one isn't an easy guess, silica. Now, the four types, primary types, there's platy structure, flaky pieces oriented horizontally. Okay? Good structure, bad structure? Not so good. That's going to pull water up and it's going to prevent water movement through the profile. So, not every type of structure is good. Where do you find it? Well, one of the places you find it is compacted soil. Okay? So, I didn't say it was natural so much. I, don't, I haven't personally seen it, but it probably exists somewhere. Prism-like, eh, whatever the word they use. Now we're going into a vertical structure, kind of a tubular structure, up and down. And then there's a distinction that you don't probably have to know. Where would you find this in the soil? This would be in the zone of ILL alluviation where things come down. What comes down? First comes down the soluble salt, then comes down the calcium. Calcium's gone, it deflocculates the soil, and the clay can move. Okay, so this is going to be in the B. And it's going to take a while. I don't know how long, but it's not going to be in any of our lifetimes. Walkie. <clears throat> now we have chunky pieces of structure. And if they're, you can call them blocky, but if they're rounded, they don't have sharp corners, subangular. Eh, maybe we should be looking for this. Typically in the B, couldn't tell you it doesn't happen in the A. And spheroidal. So now we're talking about little, more or less, irregular round things. Where are you going to find that in the soil? That's going to be in the A. That's going to be the one you find in grassland soils. And that's the one that's going to develop the quickest. So I hope that's what we're going to see. And here's a wonderful, <laughs> I'm joking, from the Soil Bible, page 475, Soil Taxonomy. <laughs> and, and here we have the prismatic and column there. 
And here we have blocky and rounded blocky, subangular blocky and platy. And this is the stuff that we're probably going to be looking for. There's also, you can say, single strate is really structureless soil. Uh, it occurs in sandy textures. Well, yeah, not just that. Massive, this is us. Or not us, this you can see. Massive refers to lack of structure. Every particle sticks to its neighbor. It's seen in sea horizons of heavy soils and puddle soils. That's a internet picture. So like, first of all, it's not that good of quality, but they're trying to show you. I can't see any structure in this. That's one of my samples. So I'm sucky rich, but still, I don't see structure. You see any structure in that, Robert? Okay. Tiny. And this is on the Clark Fork. That's structureless. What do you say, Gina? That's all volcanic? Where? Something like that? In there? Okay, now we got an idea of what's no structure. Uh, and this is kind of like what that guy was saying when he was waxing elegant the advantages of having structure. Structure, you know, air goes down, water goes down quickly because it follows down the channel. For certain kinds, not so much for spheroidal, but if you had that columnar structure, things would be boogieing down, wouldn't they? So we're going to start with the teensy, 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 two micrometers. That's 10 to the minus 6. Or, for those of us that measure things, a 10,000th of an inch. So Joe, this is where the iron and aluminum oxides we're not going to see it, but it's the beginning of particles coming together. See, and they go up one, one category, and it'd be uh, one order of magnitude on the English system here. I guess it has to be an order of magnitude on any system. All of a sudden, we're already talking about plants. Pressure of roots, or in clay particles, face to face. Plant and microbial mucilage, we're still it's, itsy bitsy stuff. And compression, you know, well, that's the shrink, that has to do with clay mineralogy. So I just wanted some data on. Um, the uh, sesquioxide component and calcium and the silica. I don't have any data on the silica. But there's plenty. There's even more. And there's even more. So we have plenty of the raw stuff for the small particles to get started. Now we move up to this. So what does 250 mean? Well, that's now we're up to a quarter of a millimeter. Still pretty tiny, okay? And now we're right into it. Microbial residues, uh, fresh material coming in from plant debris, and it requires the continuous input of plant material. That's pretty important, or you already established that it's the active stuff that's coming in from the plants that's making the soil be pretty healthy. And now it's saying, and if you stop, that will be the end of the structure process because it's dependent on it. So I just threw this in <clears throat> the sticky envelope of prokaryotic cells, the glucocalyx. OK, it could be a capsule, but also it could be a water-soluble slime layer, I should say that, that enables cells to adhere to external surfaces. And then the macro aggregates up to 3 eighths of an inch. So this is the stuff that we're actually going to observe. Now fine plant roots, mycorrhizal. Hufe, I know I'm the only one who pronounces it that way, are important. They must be continually replenished. That means if you go for degrading practices like hard grazing and stuff like that, you're going to slow this all down because we're not, it's going to slow down the whole cycle and it's, you're not going to have as much to form soil structure. And there's a good old internet picture, but we need to start somewhere. That's an internet picture. It looks like coffee grounds to me. I can't imagine what the hell that is. It doesn't look like anything you would see in a profile. I don't know if they dug it up and put it on. I don't know what that is. But here's my garden. Now, that's loaded with organic matter. <clears throat> I used to think there couldn't be structure in your garden because what? You turn it over once or twice a year, don't you? You're not, you don't grind it up. You're not really churning it. And you're certainly not churning it when it's dust dry, which would mix it more. So yeah, that has structure. OK, this is a, a high organic matter reference soil. Don't look at this. That's where the shovel was. Look at this. That way I would probably, I wanted to get your eye calibrated. I'll tell you just quickly how I did this. So these guys that were my mentors in this, they're older than me, OK? They're all retired and stuff. 
I didn't want to have to go bug them through this. So I called around Dylan. Most of those guys are retired. You can't trust anybody who's not a soil scientist. You can't trust somebody that the NRCS says, Matt, you, you're our new soil scientist. Uh-huh, what? OK, we're going to send you to a two-day short course. You need the guys that have looked in the 1,000 holes and know what they see, right? So anyway, I went to the NRCS. and. I can't help it. I came out and I said, I know more about this than you, doofus. Says, That's not helping me. I could have guessed it this myself. I need to get together with somebody. So my buddy Don Strom came over from Whitehall and we sat down to look at all the pictures. And this is a little bit of, nah, it's a, it's a moderate amount of in the eye of the beholder. But I'm going to show them to you and see if you can start to recognize this too. So you recognize it over here, maybe a little more up there. This one's from Stucky Ridge, and I have so that's a sandy loam of 1% organic matter. OK, that's minimum weak spheroidal, but I might just go like moderate. And I think I'm noticing it better up by the surface and down below. That's a clot of lime from that project. You see all the plant roots. So remember, this is right under the plant. They're all going to have lots of plant roots in them. This is going to be where the action was on. I didn't have organic matter or data on that one. I'll do one or two more. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> see structure in there. I, I definitely see aggregates that are getting up into that 3 8 inch zone. I'm seeing less down here and more up here. I see lots of plant roots coming through it and stuff. Well, I'm not seeing much here. And I look at that and it's a sand, a sand. <coughs> sand isn't much more than sand with almost no organic matter. Well, I know that one. <coughs> this isn't lime. In this case, this is rhyolite. What we call it, Gina Crystal Tufts. You know what the, the gal there that used to run it in your outfit? It was, she's a geologist. You'll know. She took your position here for a while at CTAC. Geologist, a geologist, y'all. Colleen. Colleen. It's Colleen. Yeah. 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 Um, Crystal touch calls it there. <coughs> okay. Who wants to tell me? What do you see? It's not zero. Doesn't look like the pictures I showed you with nothing. Well, you're looking at them with me. I know it's new to you, but I'm seeing very little. Very weak. Very weak. Not much going on there. Maybe a little more at the top of the picture than farther down. Yikes. OK. When you see the big cracks, that's probably from the prying. And the roots are holding that or would have fallen off. But when I see stuff like this, we're getting beyond spheroidal. We're moving into that sub-angular blocky up there. I'm seeing not just one or two, but and look what we have. Well, this one has 3.5% organic matter. That's way off the scale compared to the rest of them. The rest of them are like you know, 1%, 1 something like that. So <clears throat> that's probably going to be the best one that we see. That's just to show you that you can't do it when it's wet. <laughs> There's no use going out <laughs> looking at it. <laughs> it, it has, it's my oldest one, and uh, it already has organic matter. It would have been interesting to see. That's compost. <coughs> see that compost up in there. I still got two minutes. So I got to take. Quick story, but I stole it from somebody else. This is Tom Keck, top-notch show scientist. And he likes to tell it like this. He says, <clears throat> dog got, his dog got hit by a car. So they're in at the vets. And the vet puts up the x-ray. And he says, so you can see here. And Tom says, yeah, but it helps if you know what you're looking at. <laughs> Why would a soil scientist tell you that? If, when I say, and of course you all see the compost, and you're probably going, huh, is that what that is up there? So I'm going, you know, you have to look at these things and, and become acquainted with them pretty intimately. Tell me what you think. That's one of the best we've seen today, isn't it, in the pictures? Wouldn't you say? I would have to say that, that we would take the week out of it completely and say, yeah, that's just about a moderate. So we're seeing pretty quick development of this type of structure. And the clays have a, it's a smaller 
um, spheroids, but lots and lots and lots of them. Same thing. I look at that. That's, from, that's an artifact. But that's got pretty well-developed spheroidal. So we sum it up. We don't see eluviation loss from leaching. We don't see eluviation accumulation down below from the stuff coming down through the profile. Crumb structure, by far, is what we're going to look for and what we see. Tiny voids between aggregates are unconnected, and they don't provide all the benefits that you often hear attributed to structure. Okay, it just there's we're having little aggregates, we're having little openings, but we're not having connectivity between them. Clay soils show more structure than sandy loams of the same age. We don't have many clay soils. Soils with more organic matter, and I mean more. Don't, we're not going to say 1.3 versus 1.6, okay? But if you have three and a half percent, like we had in that one picture that had the most structure. And we see more in the upper two inches. Well, that's where the, the, the most uh, plants uh, additions are coming in from the roots and so on. And it's the most aerated zone. Even though I said at the surface it's tough, but near the surface is good. And we didn't look below the A horizon. So everything's up there. Now you're almost all students, right? Is that correct? Fronte nula fides. No reliance can be placed on appearance. That's my caution because when I see who gives talks here, sometimes I'm not positive that they are scientists, really. Enough said about that. I think you have to have a little judgment about what you're seeing. 